So, there's a big positive and a big negative when it comes to being a Nintendo Switch fan. It's 2024 and the year is already looking pretty stacked, and on the downside, I'm still playing the games from 2023. I don't know when I'm ever gonna get to these. Oh no. I know it's an old topic by this point, but it's really just insane to me how good of a year 2023 was when it comes to game releases. Like, across the board, there were so many high-quality games, but Nintendo specifically, I believe, deserves a lot of honors because in the theoretical final year of just the pure, dedicated Switch's life cycle, uh, they went crazy. Dude, this is too much. So, before 2024 really goes underway when it comes to big new releases for Nintendo as well as a brand new console, wink wink nudge nudge, I wanted to take some time to talk about all the releases of 2023 because this year should go down in history as one of the best before it's just swiftly forgotten until it becomes easy nostalgia bait for other YouTubers. Because yes, believe it or not, I do play a lot more than just the pink guy and also the alien guy. I play a lot of these games it's just, I'm a big Nintendo fanboy, I'm, that part, that part's true. So, the first big Nintendo game of 2023 was Fire Emblem Engage. Got the big box Divine Edition right here, the latest edition in the Fire Emblem series. And it was okay. I'm someone who was of the opinion that Three Houses was a fantastic game. I think when it comes to purists for the Fire Emblem fanbase, there are a lot of people who don't really like the school setting, and a lot of the time you spend doing the more uh, Persona-like aspects of doing your daily school life as well as the battles, but I really liked it. I thought the cast of characters was cool. I thought the world building of the, the school and the big campus and the area surrounding it was really interesting. The different paths you can take with uh, who you want to team up with. I thought Three Houses was fantastic, but I understand that the purists want something a little more traditional, so that's what this game is trying to do. Rather than commanding these big squads of characters as part of this giant army, every single character is just its own little unit on the map, very basic. The only big thing that changes up the gameplay now is the uh, emblem ring system, where all the characters, all the big heroes from Fire Emblem's past, you can use as equipables to modify your characters in some sort of uh, special mode that you get to activate partway through the battles. And that mechanic is pretty interesting, seeing what ring works best for which character. Uh, you know, if you do that, then sometimes the characters can interact when you're back at your home base, and those interactions are kind of neat. A lot of fan service, seeing a lot of old characters like Celica, and obviously Krom, and uh, Marth and all that is really cool. Over time with the DLC, they even added characters like Veronica from Heroes, the mobile game, which is, that's surreal. Uh, and mechanically, they're all really fun to play with. It's just that when it comes down to the story, the big thing that's sort of trying to drag you along through this big adventure... It, uh, uh, I kind of feel like it was by design that they didn't want a story that was that grandiose. It is as bare-bones cliche of a Fire Emblem story that you can get. You're the good guys, you gotta recruit the other good guys because there's the big bad guy, and he's a dragon. Ooh. I mean, the characters themselves are pretty engaging. I think when it comes to the different regions that you get to explore, they all have a different race, kind of, which is, they're, you know, it's interesting, interesting to see what the, the rules of that area are like and how everyone will come together. And, like, it's 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 neat. I, I you know, I think the, the overworld stuff and you got your little dog guy. Is the dog even on? He's not. Sami is not even on this big box art. He's like, the, the whole box art should just be Sami. But even with entertaining characters, there's just nothing about the story that sticks out. They try to do some plot twisty things, there's some betrayal, and there's some family ties, and amnesia. Like, there's a lot of different things that, in a lot of other stories, could be very interesting, but here, it all kind of falls flat. And I feel like that's by design. Like, I can't tell if they were really trying with the story, or if they were just trying to skirt by just so they can have a solid game. Because the gameplay itself, is fine. Uh, it, it, it's kind of challenging. If you're playing the harder difficulty, surely it's going to be a lot more difficult. There's some DLC in this game, too, that adds more maps, as well as an entire epilogue. And uh, maybe that's good. I actually haven't done it yet. But, uh, you know, I, I don't dislike this game. It just might be my least favorite uh, since the Fire Emblem Resurgence of Awakening. That's not true. Fates was pretty bad. So this one goes above Fates. We all know the true king is uh, Fire Emblem Echoes on the 3DS anyway, so... It's... fine. 
Plus, the opening is some of the most anime cliche garbage I've ever heard in my entire life, and it's incredible. It's one of the best openings Nintendo's ever done. It is absolute anime trash, and it's so over the top and goofy. It's amazing. If you haven't listened to it, just listen to that, and then maybe you'll want to buy the game afterwards. Guys will just see this and go, hell yeah. I mean, really, what is there to say about Metroid Prime Remastered, you know? It, it, they, it, they took one of the greatest games of all time, made it look gorgeous. It's one of the best looking games on this console. Like, it's not just a basic remaster. It feels like they properly remade it, even though they didn't, but it, it still looks incredible. That's like all, it, that's it. It's just one of the greatest games of all time, made better. The controls are perfect. It's just, oh, God, it's so, it's so good. Longtime viewers will know I made a massive mistake when this was initially uh, announced. There were so many rumors for months, and it felt like years, of the Prime games, the Prime trilogy, getting remade and remastered, and then it was the entire trilogy, and then it was just game one, and like, all the wording was all over the place when it came to the rumor mill. So when it came to just this, if you remember my reaction, I was not blown away. Uh, clearly, because it had been a while since I had played Prime 1, I was like, oh, it looks fine. I was an idiot. This is why you don't listen to me. Now, of course, I understand that this is just an old game on the new console, like, it's not that big of a deal because it's an old game, we've probably all played this already, but I don't care. This is one of the best things Nintendo's done on this console. Metro Prime Trilogy on the Wii was one of the best things they did on the Wii, and that was that was old games, and Metro, Metro Prime is just... This is one of the closest 10 out of 10 games Nintendo has ever made, and it just made better, and it's the definitive one. We will talk about this when it comes to, like, Pikmin, on the Switch, where they took these incredible games and put them on the Switch with new controls and whatnot, and slightly changed graphics, but whether or not it's definitive is hard to say because of the control options that we provided that don't translate as well to the Pro Controller, but here, I don't think that's the case. There are so many control options here that anything works uh, outside of if you really are dead set from needing a Wii Remote, then, then you, you just can't top this. Like, it's just... Oh, it's so good! Now, around this time is when the big Nintendo Direct of February 2023 took place. That's where Metro Prime Remastered was initially shown off, as well as Shadow Dropped with a physical announcement for a couple weeks later. But in that same Direct, they said, hey, we're bringing Game Boy and Game Boy Advance over to the Nintendo Switch Online service, original Game Boy and Game Boy Color on the base service, and GBA on the expansion pack. And this, this was kind of a big deal, like, in, in terms of the discussion, the general discussion for Nintendo Switch Online, because I feel like it was once Game Boy and Game Boy Advance were revealed and dropped that same day, when people started to say, hey, you know what? This is definitely worth it now. Like, as opposed to all the other times people talk about if NSO is worth it, especially is the expansion pack worth it, people started to have that conversation a lot less and just accepted that, yeah, there's a lot of great games now available for both tiers. And one of the things I always try to tell people whenever someone has a sour reaction to old games coming back on a new console like the Switch, you take a look at the Switch user base, you gotta consider this. There are, in fact, a lot of people that have not played the same games that you have, and everyone just wants these games to be accessible. Yes, these are just emulators that have the ROMs ready to go, and that's great. If you know about emulators, you've already played these games, and, and a lot more, uh, or you actually own the cartridges like, like I do and played them from way back in the day, but I know plenty of people who have played games like Amazing Mirror, Metroid Fusion, and Minish Cap, and Mario like all these games, for the first time, because they're available on the Switch, and I think that is very important, and that's why I just want more games on these services, even though you, you, you probably have access to these games in a variety of different ways. Hell, when they dropped the Game Boy and Game Boy Color app, like, all in one, and it included Wario Land 3, like, dude, are you kidding me? That's one of the greatest 2D platformers of all time, and the real ones already know that, but man, I'm so excited for more people to have that shot, and I know people who have played that game for the first time ever because they're available on the Switch. Hell yeah, that stuff is great. But I wanted to take this time to also quickly talk about, uh, some of the other Nintendo Switch Online drops that they did throughout the year because, believe it or not, there was a lot of cool stuff that dropped this year that wasn't just on the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy, uh, with Game Boy Color. Even though Alone in the Dark on Game Boy Color is one hell of a surprise. There's a lot cooler ones than that. I mean, like, for one, Kudu 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 Din in America for the first time ever. That's sick. But over on the NES side, we got Mystery Tower, Devil World, Murasame Castle, games that didn't release in America, getting localized, and I mean, we had Murasame Castle before on the 3DS and not the Wii U, which was very strange, so having that readily available now on the Switch is awesome. Mystery Tower, I believe, was called Tower of Babel in Japan, and it released on the American service with a new title screen? Like, they actually went through and 
I can't tell if it was a title screen made just for this release or they were sitting on it for years. Like, that's crazy and weird that, that we have that now, even if it's a minor deal in the grand scheme of things. And then Devil World, they acknowledged Devil World? Nintendo has a game with the devil in it and they acknowledged it. Oh, oh my God. On the Game Boy Color, we got Pokemon Trading Card Game, which is awesome. The two Oracle games, so people get to experience that craziness of linking two games together. That's awesome. Kirby Tilt and Tumble with official, like, motion controls. I, when they initially showed off the service, it said Tilt and Tumble was coming, and there was only one way they were really going to do it, a and they did it. You know, the game's not awesome, but that's super cool. They also did Quest for Camelot. Hey, they, di they didn't need to do that one. Y you didn't have to. On the Sega Genesis, they gave us Crusader of Senti and Pulse Man, two absolute bangers on the console, especially Crusader of Senti. If you have not played that game before, having a Zelda like on the Genesis with gorgeous sprite work, like, dude, it's, it's so good. And then on the N64, we got Mario Party 3, Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2, with those fantastic minigames, and GoldenEye 007. I'm not the biggest GoldenEye fan out there, in fact, I'm not a fan at all. But its significance is important, and I'm, I'm glad it's there. But also, because it's hilarious that in Japan, they released a different N NSO N64 app uh, that's just for 18 plus games. So it's, it's, I, I'm, it's either the same exact lineup, or it's just GoldenEye. It's either the same lineup with GoldenEye, or it's just GoldenEye, and I think Jet Force Gemini in Japan, I, I believe. Whatever, GoldenEye released in Japan on the NSO service, but it needed a separate app. So there's an 18 plus rated M app. That's, that's hilarious. Just keep this going. Just, just never, never stop. And actually get games that are worth a damn. Because why, why on earth is Quest of Camelot on, I don't get it. I mean, listen, all right, what, what, what more can I really say about this? I went on a whole long diatribe about it on my main channel. It's a Kirby game and it's looking better than ever and sounding better than ever. And they've had a new content with the Merry Magoland and the Magler epilogue and those things were great. Like they took a great game, made it better. Uh, it was like Metroid Prime all over again, but for Kirby's Return to Dreamland. And it's crazy because at the end of the day, this is, for Kirby game standards, like a pretty uh, average, above average experience. I think Triple Deluxe and Planet Robobot are far superior, and I would love for those games to get a similar treatment one day. Uh, but hey, this is still great, and I know a lot of people are nostalgic for the Wii era, where this was their first uh, big Kirby game. So hey, like, even if it's not my favorite Kirby game, I can't deny, like, this is, this is sick. Uh, I'm hoping now we can at least stick to one King DDD design. Uh, we could stop switching it every two games. That, that'd be nice. Bro, Sand Kirby was so sick, by the way. He comes out looking like Dio, and then it, it's also one of just the greatest copy abilities of all time. Like, kudos on you, man. That's, that's awesome. And now one of the saddest stories of the entire Switch life, Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon. This game didn't stand a damn chance, and that sucks. I mentioned a few times on this channel already that this is a big hidden gem on the console. And, uh, you know, I understand, like, there was no way this game was really gonna sell well, because it has the Bayonetta name, but outside of the main character being Cereza, there's, like, next to nothing Bayonetta about this. Like, I totally understand, when it, when it, when you compare it to Bayonetta, like, the main games, which 3 was already divisive amongst fans, like, people are not gonna be super, super into the whole idea of, hey, this one is not mature, uh, combat is not that much of the focus. It's it's purely like almost a story-driven game with a beautiful art style, and it's just meant to you like to go along and look at this crazy, beautiful storybook world. Like that's not Bayonetta fans were very iffy on this, and then in its own bubble, it's just a really cute, charming. I say PS3 360 era character action game with once again beautiful art style. But you're it's such a niche thing to make a Bayonetta prequel ish that completely changes the the entire format and gameplay loop of what Bayonetta is and I, the impact is mostly there if you care about Cheshire from Bayonetta 3 which once again people are kind of iffy on Bayonetta 3 when it comes to the story at the very least so it's like uh plus like Zelda was coming out shortly after this there was this was they, they, this game didn't stand a chance it sucks though, because I've already said this in the past, I will continue to say this until the day I die, this is going to be like one of the top five hidden gems on this console. Like years down the line, 
when uh, YouTubers are talking about all, all these crazy games you didn't get to play on the Switch while they were there. This is gonna be up there on that list, guaranteed. Fantastic game. Uh, whether or not you like Bayonetta, because I, I know people who don't like Bayonetta. They don't like the over-sexualization of uh, the characters. They don't really tend to like the high action intensity Platinum Games combat style. Like, I get it. That, that style isn't for everybody. Maybe people like that will be interested in this. But then it's... You're running two Bay... Are you gonna run two Bayonetta series at the same time and one's gonna be completely different? Like, I don't know. They made an entire sub-series now with Bayonetta Origins. I have no idea what they're gonna do going forward. They've mentioned that they would like to explore this idea some more. This... Everything about this is uh, very confusing. But... It was, it was, pre it was pretty good. All right, listen, all I was insinuating was that Nintendo released a lot of games. Uh, I, I'm not saying they were smart about how they were doing it. Advance Wars 1 plus 2 Boot Camp. The story just behind this game's existence is, uh, oh boy. When this was initially revealed at E3 years ago, like, oh man, that's it's crazy exciting. You're, you're making a brand new Advance Wars game. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a remake, but still, you're, you're bringing Advance Wars back? Like, this was a telltale sign that there's like nothing off limits anymore at Nintendo. And then, you know, the world said no. This game was like done for a very long time. There is that story about how one Switch user pre-ordered the game and I think had their internet turned off. So like it's still activated during the original release window. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that was actually legit. Like that person actually got access to the game, but it was one person and then they didn't play much of the game because they went MIA from the internet for a while. Like, that was already a weird story. And then, yeah, the delays kept happening because <laughs> the, the world happened. So much so that there was a lot of speculation that this game was just never going to release at all. And Advance Wars would just go back to the grave. Uh, but no, they, they did it. And you could tell they were just desperately wanting this game out of their system. Like, they had the entire game already worked on. Uh, I believe Way Forward is like the primary developer behind this, and I'm sure they wanted the game just sort of out of their life. So I remember when the direct happened that kind of brought the game back and gave us a release date. They didn't even show gameplay; they just talked over the entire opening of it, with, which was a beautiful animated opening. Uh, but that was it. It was just they just talked over the opening, no gameplay, and said, "Yeah, it's coming out. Uh, just whatever. That's done." I don't know how much it sold. It must not have been well, but enjoy it while you can because I don't think we're ever getting another game in this series again. I had never played Advance Wars before this. I, I, I grew into Fire Emblem with the Awakening games, and I've played some tactical games since then, like Triangle Strategy, but those are always so uh, strategy and character focused. I didn't know there was a difference between strategy and tactical because I was playing this game in front of some friends, and uh, the person who had played this game already was making fun of me because I was trying to be really uh, not pacifist, but I was really trying to be conservative with how I play because I care about the characters, but no, come to find out you really just gotta build up your army as much as you can, all their lives are expendable, just go, just go until you win, it's like Pikmin, just go and, uh, no, you're not, not even then, I care about every one of my Pikmin in Pikmin, so even, it's even worse than that, it's war, just go, no matter how many lives are lost, just go, so as a result, it did actually take me a while to get into this game, but when I did, yeah, it was fun. I, I have not beaten these games yet. Uh, I, I One thing I know is that there's not too much of the story uh, that really tying these games together. That's sort of saved for the, the DS games, I'm pretty sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, the gameplay loop of this is fun. The, the art style is very bright and bouncy. Like, the way forward aesthetic is great. I love that the maps are sort of taking place on a big army planning map. Like, uh, aesthetically, super cool. Music is great. Uh, there's some multiplayer component in here where you can, I think, play against people multiplayer. Like, there's a lot to this. I just, I guess I haven't put in the time into it enough yet because, <laughs> once again, there's a lot of video games. I just think more than anything that the story behind this game is going to be incredibly fascinating. And uh, if this this game shows up in that same hidden gem list that Bayonetta Origins is going to inevitably show up on, I hope the story goes along with it because, <laughs> oh, oh God, but you know what? Well, we're never going to get Battalion Wars uh, or Advance Wars 3. Is... Andy's dead. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. We can finally bring out another big box. Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Now, this one obviously didn't release in 2023, but the DLC did. And, uh, oh my god. 
So I'm actually a massive Xenoblade fan. I've been a fan of this franchise since the beginning with the original on Wii, so I've been with the series for well over 10 years now. And uh, getting a game in this series to be treated as special as 3 did, uh, like for one, base game, phenomenal. And then the DLC, to sort of wrap everything together from the entire trilogy, like I, I won't go into big spoilers with this franchise because I recommend everyone give all these games a shot is there is a thread that does tie some of these games together. Uh, I will keep that as brief as I can. And the DLC here tries to wrap up this trilogy. Uh, so whatever they do in the future, Xenoblade will obviously continue, but there'll be a, a new plot thread that will start, I guess. But yeah, Future Redeemed for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Fantastic. Like, the quality of that DLC is higher than a lot of, like, actual games that release nowadays. Like, it's... It's crazy. It, it's it's like a 20 to 30 hour RPG with a lot of side quests, great characters. Uh, I mean, Shulk and Rex from one and two are in it. If you if you didn't get once again, there's ties to the the other games. There's like new music, new environments. The cutscenes are great. Like th there was so much work put into Future Redeemed. Like I just I gotta give him props. I'm not normally a DLC guy, like when it came to Fire Emblem Engage, I didn't play that DLC yet. I haven't gone back to play Three Houses DLC, we'll talk about this later, but I haven't really played Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's DLC, like I'm just not that much of a DLC guy, I just never go back to games like that, but I made an exception for this, and it was well worth it. The story was just so damn good, and I do kind of wish that the story did a, took a bit of a different route in terms of what the DLC was because there are some plot points from the base game I wish were resolved, but maybe I'm just not meant to be happy, uh, which is which is fine. I'm used to it. There was some more DLC too, like that, like for the base game, there were some extra costumes and challenges and new heroes that you can recruit, and that stuff is fine. Um, like there was a robotic one. That, I think that may have been in 2022. I don't even remember when that first DLC launched, but I mean the DLC for Xenoblade games really cool. Uh, I don't feel like I missed out for not doing those things in the base game, really, because I played the game at launch, but man, Future Redeemed, so good. If you have not taken the time to go back to the DLC, if you're someone like me who sits on DLC for a long time, go back and do it. It's just a, just a shining achievement all around. Two big boxes back to back, hell yeah. Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. I mean, what what can really be said. I think the most interesting thing to come out of Tears of the Kingdom is sort of the general consensus of this and Breath of the Wild uh, like weeks after the game came out because I think like many others when this game first came out yeah it was it was a gleeful experience. The whole idea of taking Breath of the Wild and then hey we're gonna use the same world again in the sequel uh, and it's gonna take forever to develop even though it's the same world. Oh boy, I wonder what they're gonna do. Turns out, uh, it was a lot. It, it was a lot. The, the Tears of the Kingdom made Breath of the Wild look like a tech demo, which is insane because years ago we were talking about how that was the greatest game of all time. Like, it's crazy. It's it, it's crazy the achievements that this game sort of got away with, uh, and that's awesome. But then the consensus soon after turned into, great, and now I never want them to do this again. You know, at the point of filming this in early 2024, I can say that the whole, uh, the community reaction to Tears of the Kingdom is strange because everyone acknowledges that it's like a great game. If you didn't like Breath of the Wild, you're not really gonna, you know, this game's not really gonna convert you. But it, w it was weird how the majority of like, the, like just the loudest people in the fan base shifted sort of out of nowhere. It was just everyone talked about, oh man, you can do all these crazy things with all these pieces that you can put together. People were building robots and these giant mechanical like d death machines and you're, you're shooting the different Koroks into space. Like there's a lot of crazy things. A as a giant playground, Tears of the Kingdom excels, but I am part of the same community that says, cool, I really want the next Zelda game to be linear once again, uh, at least not as open as this is. Breath of the Wild initially was like a response to so many giant AAA games being these giant open worlds. And they were like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try to break the conventions of Zelda and do it ourselves. And they did a great job. And then they said, okay, we spent so much time developing it. Let's see if we can get more money and not put in the same amount of work to make an entire new game again. So they did this. And there's still so much, like they didn't even talk about the underground stuff once and all of the pre-hype and left it for everybody to figure out. Like Nintendo was in a unique opportunity where they didn't have to say a whole lot. They just knew people were gonna buy the game. And there were so many secrets left to uncover and that is awesome that they're able to really sell a game just on its namesake 
and it was going to be a good game. Like, still a fantastic game, but I think a lot of people are overshadowing uh, how good this game is with just already talking about the next one. It's like the group of people who are still very impatient about waiting for Wind Waker and Twilight Princess to hit the Switch, which, <laughs> myself included on that, but a lot of people really uh, want a high quality, super high fidelity and polished, more linear experience like Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, just with a lot of the, you know, modern flourish. And I understand that. I understand that and I hope that's coming soon too. I don't think that should muddy what this and Breath of the Wild did though. I think it's unfortunate that I guess the last brand new traditional Zelda game, like traditional-ish, was... A Link Between Worlds on 3DS, I guess, was like the last brand new, and even that wasn't brand new, that was based on Link to the Past, so... A lot of people crave a brand new stylistic linear Zelda game. I understand. I understand that, uh, and I'm only saying this because I feel like conversation, even in the comments, are gonna... Go, uh, go about the same route that I was talking about, but... I mean, this, this game is great! Exploring all the sky islands, finding all the new caves in the overworld, going into the depths and just seeing how spooky things are there. There are so many side quests on all three layers. All of the dungeons, or I should say the, the shrines, are a lot more clever than they were before. And even the dungeons, yeah, they are better. They're, they're not, you know, they're not as good as traditional dungeons, of course, but they are better than what Breath of the Wild had. Like, I think objectively this is better than Breath of the Wild. Um, and had one of the best end sequences of the entire franchise too, like the Master Sword sequence and the ending sequence. Absolutely draw-dropping. Some of the best stuff Nintendo's ever done. Maybe this topic requires a different time and a place to go over the, the current state of Zelda. We, maybe we can talk about that at a different time, but... But yeah, at the end of the day, I think in its own bubble, uh, as well as compared to its sequel, or its prequel, Breath of the Wild, incredible achievements and should be celebrated uh, for years and years to come. And I also do want the next Zelda game to be more linear. Both of those things can be true. Of course I don't own everybody 1 to switch. What am I, nuts? I don't know why this- I, I don't- I don't understand. I don't understand. You want to talk about a game that has this weird story going into its reveal? Like, everybody 1 to switch is one of them. I think everyone sort of got to a common consensus that the first game's not good. It's not like there's something that, you know, people are discussing the validity of those comments. Everyone just has this agreement that, yeah, first one's not good. And randomly, Last year, uh, there were starting to be reports about, hey, Nintendo's actually working on a sequel, and everybody who's played it says it's the worst thing ever conceived by man. And uh, Nintendo said, cool, let's release it. I, I genuinely don't understand. I genu- I just don't- I just don't get it. Wanna party? Break out the Nintendo Switch system and laugh it up at your next game- I mean, to be fair, we will be laughing. God, and then MC Horus, the head, the guy is MC Horus. Like, that's, that's gross. So I have had the misfortune of playing just a tiny smidge of this game. And uh, yes, of course, it is bad. But the thing, that, the thing that makes it crazy is it's actually, I would say it's worse than the original 1-2-Switch. There is some ambition in this sequel and having these bigger multiplayer games where you can use your phone and you can play with more than, what, 16 players? I don't know, I don't remember the count, whatever. You can play with a big amount of people using their phone like a Jackbox game, and that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, some games, like, require the camera, and that's, that's like, that's, that's kind of neat, but, you mean, I mean, nothing, like, the fact that the 1-2 Switch game before was a selling point for the Switch hardware, like, I still think that ends up being better because, Nothing else really compares still to like the milking the cows and the eating sandwiches and the turning the the dial on the safe. Those things that use the Joy-Con like in really interesting ways that not a whole lot of games in the entirety of the Switch's life ended up using. Th this guy, this has a guy with the horse head. Have fun. At least they had the common decency of charging only $30 for it. And I guess at some point I will own it for the sake of the collection. I, I don't know why they did. I don't know why they did this. It didn't show up any in any directs. They did a video where they flew out a bunch of influencers to uh, Japan, I think, to play it, and I I couldn't tell who any of the influencers are. I don't know who was in charge of that. To be fair, if they asked me, I probably would have said no. But yeah, it just released, and then uh, no one ever talked about it again. And that's it's probably for the best. Oh yeah, they had they had red light, green light. Thank God. So yeah, 2023 was also the year when peak happened. These are two other games that I've gone in very lengthy detail about on my main channel, but I love Pikmin so much. It's one of my favorite franchises of all time. Pikmin 4 is one of the best Nintendo games of all time. Like, 
Is it, that's crazy. Without a doubt, that was my game of the year. It was just a purely magical experience from start to finish, and like, yeah, there was maybe a little bit too much dialogue, and the tutorial took a little too long to, to wrap up, but that's not going to deter the fact that it's, a, it's just a purely magical game from start to finish, and fixed every single issue I've had with any of the other previous games. Like, God, it's so... It's so good. Look at the dog. Look at Ochi. It's amazing. It's another one of those things, man, where if you ever doubt Nintendo, they prove to you that you're wrong. This is one of the few games that they develop in-house, and it's just... It's just seeping with charm all the way. I, if I had any negatives about Pikmin 4, it's that, like, none of the music is all that great. Not memorable. I can't really recall much of anything from the soundtrack, but... You know, whatever. On, on its base level, it's still it's still awesome. They fixed the cave system, the management of the Pikmin is great. Uh, it's just awesome. I do have one other downside, because on a playthrough, I ended up losing a Pikmin, and I forgot... I didn't even realize it until I went down to the next floor of a cave, and you can't rewind days like you can in the other Pikmin games. That sucks, because now I'm not... I wanted to do a deathless run. And I, I lost one, and I can't go back, so that sucks. I was 10 hours down the drain. I'm still, I'm, it's still a 10 out of 10 game, though. And then Pikmin 1 and 2. For one, uh, one of the very few, I think of only two so far, Switch multi-carts that Nintendo themselves published. Like, two games on one cart. Nintendo doesn't do that so often. They've only ever done that with the Famicom Detective Club combo pack, which only released in Japan, so that's a pretty big deal. And, uh, yeah, it's... That's, it's awesome! It's, it's awesome! I think the biggest talking point with the Switch versions of these games uh, comes down to the controls, and I do think at the end of the day, I do prefer the Wii Remote and Nunchuck for these games, just pointing and aiming like that. I still, I still think that's the way Pikmin is best until they change the camera angle, at least in 4. But in 1 and 2, like, the gyro is fine, it only really activates when you're holding a Pikmin to throw them, and if you're whistling, and it works. And having these games portably is awesome. Uh, I did play both of them multiple times, actually. I, I still love these games to death. I do still think, though, that the Wii versions are better, but still phenomenal games. And, you know, combined with Pikmin 3, having all of the mainline Pikmin games on one console now is great. And now I'm just waiting for a Hey Pikmin HD, because why not? Why not? If you're gonna do Luigi's Mansion 2, damn it, do a game that's actually good. And now we're at the segment of the video where I don't know where else to put these. Uh, but hey, Nintendo released more downloadable content. Let's cover it all now. We already touched on Fire Emblem Engages and Xenoblade Chronicles 3's DLC, which felt a lot more substantial. There was a lot to really dive into, even though I haven't really done uh, Engages DLC. I can tell that's like I got to sit down and properly like prepare uh, for these. I, I kind of feel like it was just, hey, uh, there's more stuff now. I think the only one that doesn't really apply to is Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I guess, because there is some substantial story DLC uh, with this game. I just haven't done it yet, and I'm not sure why. So like I've already said, when it comes to DLC, I don't really tend to get around to them all too often, but the weird thing about Scarlet and Violet is I genuinely loved these games. Like, they were incredibly jank, like I get it. Social media would have you believe that these are some of the worst things ever and we should be holding Game Freak you know, accountable for their terrible actions and what they can get away with on the Nintendo console. Like, oh, they have so much money. Like, I get it. That being said, it's a really fun game. Like, once I got into the gameplay loop, I was incredibly addicted, and then the end game is, like, the it's easily the coolest end game of the entire Pokemon franchise. So, I don't know if it's my number one gen. Gen 5 holds a very special place in my heart, but this is up there. Love this game to death. So, when it comes to the DLC, the, the Area Zero stuff, with, what is it, the Teal Mask and the Indigo Disc, I should care. I'll... I'll get to it. The thing is, like, I was really content with how the story ended in Scarlet and Violet, that I wasn't really clamoring for DLC, and I haven't really seen a whole lot of people talk about the new things as like, oh man, you gotta play these. It's like, okay, so there's some new areas, and there are new legendary-ish Pokemon attached to each of them. So I guess if I want to be kept in the loop, I should see what they're all about. Because there's like these weird monkey things, or whatever, there's like, I, I don't know what exactly all three of them are, but there's three different animals that work together for one thing. There's Ogre Pond is one of them. There's like a turtle thing that's very shiny, I think that's part of the second one, the Indigo Disc. This is one of those things where you let me know. You let me know if the DLC is great. I just think it's notable. I just think the fact that we're at a point now where Instead of annualizing the Pokemon games, like, 
they actually took some time now and made DLC. It's, it's I understand that the game's like does does like programming wise not great, still fun. But now that I'm I'm, I'm kind of selling myself on the DLC. For all I know, I'm gonna have this DLC done by the time the video goes out. Mario Plus Rabbit Sparks the Hope. The DLC for this game is mostly incredible because Rayman came back. Hell yeah. There were a few DLC waves that turned into just a bunch of extra challenges, and there is some extra story stuff with a uh, Spark Hunter. I, it was like the last Spark Hunter was the second wave. But myself, like many other guys, are like, hey, that DLC is cool and all, but wave three, or oh, Rayman's back, they acknowledged him. Oh, they brought him back from the dead. They performed necromancy on my boy. And it's, it's, it's fine. And that kind of sucks to say. It kind of sucks to say that it's just fine. Like, I, I think the thing is, when it comes to Mario plus Rabbids, this little sub-series that's been developed, I really like the fan service -y things that they're doing and, like, crossing over both genres. When it comes to Rayman and the Phantom Show, getting to play as Rayman in 3D, incredible. They incorporate the Lums as, like, things you can interact with in the battle environment. That's great. You can use your hover hair to explore, like, the big stage where some items are. Cool. There's like no references to anything Rayman's done in the past ever, besides I think something that references Barbara from from Legends. It's very minimal. If anything, it's more more so a reference to the first game with the opera singing rabbit. That's like the biggest reference. So I think Rayman as a character was was not utilized correctly. I'm super happy he's back for now. If this evolves into something in the future, that'd be great. Uh, Rayman doesn't even get to interact with Mario at any capacity. It's just Rabbit Peach and Rabbit Mario, which neat. I mean, rabbits have a history with Rayman, of course. Um, they could have done more. I think the last Spark Hunter is actually better DLC, which is crazy, but it's okay. The best DLC for Mario and Rabbids is the Donkey Kong Adventure from the first game. Anyway, they got Grand Kirkhope to remix the Donkey Kong Island theme from DK64. That's the best DLC. That's better DLC than anything Sparks of Hope had. I'm sorry. But yeah, the very clear heavy honcho was Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's Booster Course Pass, finally wrapping up at the end of 2023. Six waves in the toilet, and man, there is a whole lot of courses in this game now. The part that was the most fun with this DLC over the whole two year period was seeing the general conversation go from, oh, this is terrible, these are just tour courts, and they don't look great, they didn't put in the effort to, hey, wow, they're actually putting in some effort, they're picking some great courses, wow, like, finally understanding just how many options there are in Mario Kart 8 now, and it was great to feel really excited for a new wave to drop. Like, hell yeah, dude, how many more courses? Let's go, there's 96 courses in this game now. Insane. Quite honestly, when they introduced Maple Treeway at the end of 2022, I was of that, uh, that camp that said, okay, whatever they do afterwards, I don't care. I got my course, I got my Maple Treeway, I'm fine with whatever they do. And I think the remainder of the courses, there weren't really a ton of massive surprises. There were good ones in there, like Wii Rainbow Road, obviously great. I liked Riverside Park, even though it was short. Uh, Singapore, I believe, was in, yes, yeah, Singapore Speedway was in there. And I think that's my favorite tour course. That course looks incredible, the music is great, love that. The Bowser's Castle they did at the end is great. I think Sunset Wilds is like the only real disappointment. Only because it was never a great course, but the sun would actually set in the original game and in tour, and it doesn't innate. You ruin the entire point of that course, Nintendo. But yeah, outside of not having, what, what was it, the Airship Fortress stage from DS pop up, and instead we got like the Daisy Circuit from the Wii game and Rosalina's Ice World from Seven for some reason, like, eh, whatever. One course I really wish was in the game out of 96, not too bad, so. Hey, Mario Kart 8, took them like 10 years since the original Wii U release, but hey, it's, a, it's finally an incredible game. Quickly want to bring up F-Zero 99 as well, since that released at that Nintendo Direct, and, uh, you know, I may have mis, you know, misrepresented F-Zero fans in my reaction when I said I thought all the F-Zero fans were going to be pissed because they weren't getting a an actual game, they were getting just a free-to-play thing for NSO in their yearly tradition of killing off one 99 game and replacing it with another one. Pac-Man died, so F-Zero can walk. And fundamentally, yeah, F-Zero 99 is a lot of fun. It's yeah, a bunch of cars going, it's, it's instead of the normal, what is it, eight? I don't know how many F-Zero typically has, but whatever. Instead of the normal amount, it's 99, it's pure chaos. Great. F-Zero fans clearly love uh, F-Zero 99. I am not one of those people, I am sorry. 
Usually on social media, whenever anyone does the whole like, oh, give me a video game opinion that has people want to kill you. Mine is usually, I think F-Zero is not great. Uh, I have played F-Zero 99. I put a decent amount of time into it and came to the conclusion that it's just not for me. I am super happy for all of the fans out there who have something that they genuinely like. Some F-Zero fans say it, it's even like maybe their favorite F-Zero game because of just how it really amplifies the chaotic nature of that franchise. But just for me, I genuinely get mad playing it. It could just be that I'm not good. That's valid. Put me in Maple Tree Wave, that's, that's fun. But now the main conversation is just what are they gonna do next after F-Zero is all done with? Like F-099, they're gonna kill off at some point. They gotta make a new franchise to 99. Uh, Urban Champion 99. I'm thinking Urban Champion comes back next. Another game I actually don't own, but I'm very interested in seeing what the conversation is like about this game. Detective Pikachu Returns. I... I don't care. Detective Pikachu has the distinction of being one of the earliest titles announced for the console. They initially said, hey, it's, it's like either going to be a sequel or a remake of the first game and it's going to be on the Switch. They announced this years and years ago and then it just went MIA. And then it showed up at a, at a direct and it looked not good. It was a sequel, but it looked like an up 3DS game. Like the animations and cutscenes are really low quality. The texture work is pretty poor. Like I just don't understand where the work went. Uh, I know the Switch isn't all that powerful as we as we can tell with the other Pokemon games, but I, okay, not a great first showing. But then the game came out and reviews were just kind of average and it, no one talked about it after the fact. Like, Detective Pikachu is a weird... is a weird beast of a sub-series of Pokemon. I played the 3DS game, and that wasn't really all that good. It was like Baby's first Ace Attorney game, you know, just like a basic detective game, but hey, Pokemon are there, and that's kind of cool. And hey, look at that! Pikachu talks and likes coffee! Ha-ha! <laughs> but it's just the characters aren't good, and the mysteries aren't interesting, and the sequel... I haven't played it. I probably will at some point, but it doesn't sound like it really improved anything, it just is... more. I get the sense that the only thing Detective Pikachu that people really like is the movie, and even then I actually wasn't a big fan of the movie. Uh... You know, I, I don't want to upset the Detective Pikachu fans out there, but that movie did put me to sleep, I'm not gonna lie, I just don't think it's for me. Uh, I'm not a big Pokemon hater, you know, clearly there are aspects of Pokemon that I really enjoy, and... One of the things is the side series that show off a different, you know, a different look on the Pokemon world. And you would think that this would be for me, but yeah, yeah, you, you tell, if anyone out there's played Detective Pikachu, let me know because that's just, I, I, $50, get the hell out of here. Oh, there we go. The best game. The turnaround on like the game's reveal to releasing, it was, it was June, it was the June Direct, came out in October, I'm pretty sure. And, like Pikmin 4, it's one of the best games Nintendo's ever made. Like, I just love the fact that, that they Nintendo clearly does not need this multi-year hype cycle. Like, they did that for Zelda. They didn't need that for this. They were like, hey, we're making this 2D Mario game out. No, it's gonna be kind of incredible, I guess. Buy it in a few months. Ah! Uh, I mean, at this point, what can really be said about Wonder? I, I still need- like, I want to play through it again to really digest it now that the initial hype cycle has passed. But, like many other people, I was not. Super thrilled with all the new Super Mario Bros. games. All I wanted was a Mario game that had some personality, and they they did that. This is like, this is almost a sequel to Mario Land 2 than anything proper, like recent 2D Mario. Just the amount of creativity is obviously insane, and they should be they should be very proud of what they accomplished with this title. Daisy's playable. N look at her. I'm not gonna run your ear off with a lot of the same things you've heard and many other people talking about this game in the past. I did do a tier list of like all of the different wonder effects and that was really fun to do. So if you have, if you didn't catch that, that, that was a lot of fun. You get all my opinions in that video. And I think the most interesting thing that's gonna be coming out of wonder in the, the months and years to come is similar to how the conversation shifted with Tears of the Kingdom. I'm kind of interested to go back to Mario Wonder in a few months, in a few years, and look at this more critically and how fun it is to replay. Uh, when it comes to basic 2D platformers, a lot of Mario games tend to be a lot of fun to replay. Once the the wows of the Wonder Effect are all worn off, is this game still going to be incredible? My initial response to that question is yes. I think right now Mario World is my number one like 2D Mario game, and then this is my number two. Honestly, with Mario Land 2, probably is my number three. This is probably a video in and of itself, but that's the thing I'm interested in with Mario Wonder the most. 
is how well it's gonna hold up over time when the wow factor is gone. Uh, yeah, that 2D Mario's in a great spot. And uh, as far as the Switch is concerned, we got a better, the, the original 2D Mario game is better than the original 3D Mario game being Odyssey. I think this game is better. Take that with however you like. Take that however you, just get mad at me in the comments, I appreciate it. Or agree with me. I don't know, that's my hot Mario take. Oh, uh, hey, look at that, blink and you miss it, it's WarioWare. Oh, hey, look, oh, who cares? It's, oh, it's Super Mario RP. Okay, do you see the problem now? That was the problem with WarioWare moving for the Nintendo Switch. What an insane six-week period Nintendo put themselves in at the end of last year. Mario Wonder, two weeks later, WarioWare Move It, two weeks later, a remake of Mario RPG. This game, you know, Nintendo released a lot of games in 2023. A lot of them didn't stand a chance right out of the gate. This is one of them. That's a shame. Even back in the Nintendo Direct when this is initially revealed, they had like that one Mario block that had Mario RPG, Princess Peach Showtime, Luigi's Mansion 2, and then we waited until like near the end of the Direct to say, also Wario. Why didn't you, why didn't you include that? It's so weird, it's like they disrespected this game right out of the gate, which is annoying because this is, this is one of the best WarioWares. WarioWare's smooth moves on the Wii is such a fun time. Like even nowadays, its usage of the motion controls is incredible and it's, it's a little bit more, you know, rudimentary compared to some of the motion controlled experiences we've gotten in years since, but it's still a lot of fun. It's the perfect amount of wackiness and the controls still feel really good when you know how to use them and like, hey, oh, they said fine, we're gonna make a sequel to that and, and nobody cared. It has an island thing. It has an island gimmick. It's awesome. You know, nearing the end of the Switch's life, not, not a whole lot of games just straight up don't allow handheld play because you have to use the Joy-Cons. You can do it tabletop and I've done that, but you can't play it handheld. Not many games do that. Super Mario Party did that and I'm sure some others do as well, but that's just weird. WarioWare's life on the Switch is gonna be a very interesting one looking back because Get It Together was fun but not traditional, and then we got this traditional one, but it's it's one that's purely based on motion controls. And I I think it's I think it's really fun, but it does kind of come across as just another WarioWare game. You know, you go in, you start as Wario, and then you go to the next few levels, and it's just you get to see some more characters in their wacky antics, just with the island aesthetic, and then you do a couple remixes, and then that's it. And then you can just go for higher scores if you want. It's okay. See, one of the nicest things about WarioWare Get It Together was that there was the Wario Cup mode, which had weekly challenges that you could participate in, and you could just get yourself into the leaderboard and get some more points for your characters because there were some customization options in there. Like, all that stuff was great. Move It lacks all that. Move It is just a WarioWare game. There are some multiplayer games in here that are fun. You can eventually unlock a brand new Pioro game, and that's really fun. But this really feels like they didn't try to advance anything. It's just, we're gonna make a new WarioWare game that's purely motion control based, and we waited like the entirety of the Switch's life to have another game that uses the IR camera on the bottom part of like the right Joy-Con. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, it's weird. It's it's not even like I have a, I have a whole lot to say about this. It's, it's if you played one Wario game, you have the basic idea of how this works. There's some intricacy to get it together. There's like a tier list of characters you should play as in that game, and that's like, really interesting. This is just, hey, we made we made another one, and it's good. It's good, it's just Nintendo released it at the worst time imaginable, probably too overpriced, you know, with that extra context. And uh, who knows, at, at, at some point, if this drops in price, I would recommend it. I, I think, I think the only game it's beating the sales of in the Wario franchise is Game & Wario for the Wii U. That's depressing. But hey, who cares? On to the actual star of the show for the holiday season 2023. Wario had to die, so Mario RPG, Gino, and Mallow can live. I can't believe this is real. You know, I'm just staring at the game now on the carpet, and it's just... It's mind-boggling that this actually exists. This is something that no one ever thought would actually happen because of the Nintendo and Square Enix crossover, or just Square Soft crossover from back in the day. Gino's Erasure from... Uh, the Mario and Luigi remake on 3DS and, you know, not giving Gino to us in Smash Brothers and still using the crappy me costume, like, I, all that disrespect made me think that this was never gonna happen, and then it showed up, and I was just in awe. And it came out, and it's amazing. Mario RPG was always like a beginner RPG, one that you can 
You can go through without a ton of commitment. It's not super long. It'll probably take you like 18 hours or so. The original on Super Nintendo and the Super Nintendo game does hold up, has a very interesting art style that like one of those art styles that really is better if you play it on an old CRT. That's like one of those games where the art style was built with that in mind to make it look kind of 3D. And here they went with just this really cartoony, little tiny, little tiny fat boy Mario. And there's a lot of quality life things that make the game go by so much faster. So I think all in all, I think I beat the game in 12 hours, which for an RPG and an incredible one. A lot of people talk crap about this box art too, but quite frankly, I think this is one of the funniest box arts Nintendo's ever made. Like it's based on the original Japanese art. And I think, I think that's just a cool throwback, but even without that context, like it's just, there they are. There's all the fellas, this is, this is the game. Similar to my point about NSO games and retro games hitting that service, there's just something that's really cool about getting new people to experience these classics in different ways, because not everybody got to play this game. I, I played this game originally on the Wii Virtual Console. Once the Virtual Console stopped becoming a thing, it was gonna be, okay, is this, gonna, is this game gonna hit the NSO service? Well, Square may not want that. Square may want may want to get money on that, but are they really gonna remake it? And then in, in the middle of this hype cycle, they announced Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door. Like, this and Mario Wonder represent such a turning point in the Mario franchise in terms of its creativity. Like, it's so important. This is such an important game. The secret boss was handled beautifully in this. Like, I, I, I do kind of wish there was maybe some more stuff in here, because it is very much like they remade the game, all right. Not a whole lot of new stuff besides like some of some extra bosses, which are kind of cool. But man, it's, it's, I can't believe this is real. Before we wrap things up, I want to do a quick shout out to some more of the exclusives that came out on the Switch that were not, you know, developed by Nintendo, but you can only get these games on Nintendo consoles, at least, you know, currently at the time of filming this video. And these games are all pretty fun uh, for different, <laughs> for, I mean, looking at, looking at this, fun for different reasons. Silent Hope is this really fun action RPG with roguelike mechanics that came out courtesy of Marvelous. Dragon Quest Monsters, like, this game's existence is kind of crazy because it's a sequel to like a sub-series that's a monster catching Dragon Quest series that started on Game Boy and Game Boy Color, and then there was one on 3DS, I believe, that didn't get localized. I actually don't know the entire history of the Dragon Quest monster subgenre, but I've seen this game in action, and it's really cool, and it's sold like crazy, so congratulations to Square Enix. The more Dragon Quest, the better. Here's hoping 2024 gives us Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D. Fitness Boxing Fist of the North Star, that's just hilarious. I guess I'm going for a fitness boxing collection now because uh, there's a Hatsune Miku coming out in 2024. And if we're going to start adding licensed characters to the fitness boxing franchise, I am all in because that's amazing. Raincoat is an interesting beast. It's by the Danganronpa creators. And I think the Danganronpa games hold up better than this. I thought the story was not all too enticing in Raincoat, but the fact that it exists is really cool. Uh, I'm someone who really likes visual novel games like that. So Danganronpa and Zero Escape and the Ace Attorney and all those styles of games. So I was into this immediately. And uh, yeah, it's still it's still pretty cool. If you never played a game like this before, I mean, Danganronpa is the better pick, but this is still a really fun game that goes through these insane, mind boggling twists and turns. And uh, hopeful that we do get more stuff from this guy and his team in the future. And then also a big shout out to, I don't know how you actually say the entire title, but Mameda no Bakuru is how you say at least that middle part, I can tell that, that's that's like kind of in English. This was a game that was showing up in Nintendo Directs and it was like a 3D platformer by Goodfeel that was in the style of like a Goemon game, like the Goemon series from Konami. Why? I mean, for all I know, when this video goes live, this, this game will have been announced for localization, but the fact that it didn't initially is insane because it's made by Goodfeel. The guys who did Kirby's Epic Yarn, Yoshi's Woolly and Crafted World, like why would you not? And Goodfeel's also done other games that have gotten localized. So why, why the really good one? So I got impatient, I imported a physical and I've been playing it and it's awesome. It, it, it plays really great. It's so PS2 coded. If you're someone like me who also loves just GameCube PS2 era style platformers that meld some genres together, this one with beat em up, it's awesome. That like, there is some story stuff that I can't understand because it's all in Japanese, but you really don't need it. The whole gimmick is you are like a little drum master. You're like a taiko drum master. You 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 do combat 
with your two paddles and they were both done with the L and R buttons, so left and right for swinging back and back like that. Like, that's awesome. That's almost like Donkey Kong Jungle Beat levels are cool. But on top of all the other Nintendo games we got this year, these are also Nintendo exclusive. I'm sure there's some other exclusives out there that I missed, but these are the ones that I have. And uh, just goes to show that 2023 was really something special. Man, and all this stuff for 2023 it doesn't even count the Mario movie. That was obviously a big deal, broke a ton of records and it was a lot of fun and obviously is going to start an extra little mini franchise of Nintendo movies, which I am all down for, especially if we get some Pikmin movies. But that was a big deal. Uh, they opened up Nintendo World in Los Angeles. That's awesome. Haven't been yet. Hopeful to at some point. Uh, what else was there? They did Nintendo Live at PAX West and that was really cool. Something new and different. Uh, I feel like... I feel like there's something else, there's something else that they did video game wise that I'm forgetting. Um, oh yeah, they also added Wonder Flowers to Mario Run for mobile phones. What the 